When you hear someone talk about investing, you'll probably wonder in what company they've invested or how many Bitcoin they have. Well, if you're a filmmaker, there are other ways to invest your money in, which can result in a nice return over time. When I ask you to name two different sources of income as a filmmaker, what would your answer be? The biggest source of income for me, besides my day fee, is my equipment. Each tool has a different price tag. Think of my camera A, which is the Sony FX6, perhaps a camera B. This, as you can imagine, counts up pretty fast. Let's divide investing into two categories, money losing and money making investments. The money losing investments sound like an absolute no-go, but since we can actually use the products, it earns itself back over time. So by using, for example, our Pocket 6K Pro, we can earn it back by adding it to our invoice for every job that we use it on. If we sell the camera five years later, it will most likely have dropped in price significantly, but we have already made a massive profit by renting it out to ourselves. Then you've got money making investments. This is, of course, no guarantee as with any type of investment. Two years ago, I decided to invest my money into old Leica R lenses. Partly, it's their amazing image quality, build quality and characteristics, but it's also the hype that makes them rise in price. Now, the question you may have is, should I invest or not? Investing your money in a basic film kit is a wise choice. This lowers the barrier to shoot and will most likely motivate you to take it out more often and create things. As you grow as a filmmaker, you will notice that clients start asking for different gear. In my situation, I was asked to shoot a TV show, which had to be done on a Sony camera. Now, I could rent an FX6 every shooting day, which were 32 days. So uh, let's do the math here. In Holland, you pay 225 euros for an FX6 set with some batteries and stuff. That is 32 times 225. That equals a staggering 7,200 euros. Wait a moment. The price of a new FX6 is 6,700 euros. That's a no-brainer, of course. I made this purchase, and over the course of this job, I got myself a free Sony FX6. But... What if you don't have such long projects? Well, that is why I still call it investing. By seeing a pattern in past jobs, you can make the call to switch to a more expensive setup that is in higher demand. Of course, you should only do this if you're sure it will either get you more higher paying clients or that you personally benefit from having that camera. Now, what do I consider smart investments beside your camera body? Number one, lenses. Lenses are hands down the best investment for filmmakers. Think of brand specific glass like Sony or Canon or Panasonic, um, you know, in either zooms or primes, they will lose value over time, but you know, you can transfer these lenses from system to system. So they will last you a very long time, time enough to be earned back, you know. Vintage glass is also very popular. Take a look at Contact Zeiss, Leica R, Minolta Rockers, Canon FD, Nikker AI, and Zucos. As they're not in production anymore, but the demand keeps going up, they will most likely rise in price. Number two, tripods. A good tripod will last you a lifetime. They are relatively stable in price and they're essential for good and proper pan and tilts. I chose to invest in the Sechler, or Sechler, I don't know how you pronounce it. Sechler Flowtech 75 system with the Active 8 head. The reason for this is that I can increase the height of the tripod in a second without breaking my back. Before, with my Gitzo tripod, I had to loosen all the rubber rings each time, which really is annoying. Number three, power. Power for your cameras is very important. I made the mistake to invest in cheap V-Lock batteries, which did let me down many times. I've invested in Anton Bauer Micro 150s. It came in a set of four batteries with a duo charger that charges both batteries simultaneously. I can run the Sony FX6 pretty much the entire day and come home with two bars left over. I also own some smaller batteries, such as the Sony MPF batteries for my Blackmagic pocket camera and various lights, like the Ameren lights, which you cannot see, but they're up in the ceiling. Number four. Lighting. After you've got a basic kit locked in, investing in some lights might be smart. 
However, if you're doing jobs that don't require you to bring lights at all, it might be a waste of money. In my case, where I do both, I have an Aperture 600X with a giant 150 softbox for interviews, an Aperture MT Pro as a kicker or, you know, like a little light that I can hook onto the refrigerator or something because it's magnetic, and a bunch of other smaller lights that I use as a backlight, as a fill light somewhere. And if I need something bigger, I go to the rental. I also own some accessories like a Matthews floppy and some cheap polyboard. Um, check out this video I made on negative fill. It's extremely easy to use and very nice. And it's probably one of my favorite tools to use in filmmaking. So the link is uh, up here. Number five, audio. Audio is something I try to hire professionals for when I can. I can do it. Come on, you can do it. Yeah. It not only distracts me from the creative decision making, but it's also stressing me out a lot. Having said that, I do own some audio equipment. I started out with the Deity V-Mic D3 Pro, which is a great self-powered shotgun mic for running gun stuff. Um, but recently I picked up the NTG5 from Rode. This microphone is for some more serious stuff and some documentaries that I shoot. I've done plenty of research and I've chose this one because of the weight and the quality of sound. Number six, <laughs> computers and data. Since I do a lot of editing and color grading, I've invested in a good machine. The MacBook Pro 14 inch M1 Pro with 16 gigs of RAM. However, if you're doing just some browsing on the internet, you'll probably get away with a lot cheaper and lighter like the MacBook Air. For data, I use SSDs only when I'm out in, you know, field work or out, out and about on set. As I had a lot of trouble with actual spinning disks, um, I rather pay a little bit more, but the thought of not losing my data is very comforting. Number seven, accessories. The most recent investment I've made was a cart, a very heavy steel production cart. This cart makes my life so much easier because before I had to drag all my stuff around in this cheap blue trolley, which creaks and make annoying sudden moves left and right. This new cart has a plate to mount my camera on for easy prepping and lens switches. Um, it rolls like a dream and it folds away very small. I can even put it in the trunk of my car. Um, this is definitely not one of the first things you need to buy if you're a filmmaker. But if you're doing a lot of days on set, this can definitely make your life a lot easier because everything is in one place and you can move it around. So yeah, it makes the life of a filmmaker a lot more pleasant. I'm very easy when it comes to my gear. When friends hire me to shoot a fun project, it's always nice to be flexible and take my Leica glass when the budget otherwise would not allow it. I suggest you stay humble at all times. Making friends in this industry is far more important than earning an extra penny of every job that you do. We've mostly talked about investing in exchange for money. Something worth mentioning is the investment of time using the gear. You can own all the fanciest gear in the world, but if you're too lazy to actually put it to good use, you'll hardly gain enough experience to make it in this hard world. That is the most important note that I want to give you guys because leaving your gear to collect dust on the shelf is pointless. All right, thank you so much for sitting this one out with me. I know it's a long one, but hopefully it was useful, helpful, and uh, hopefully you can earn a little bit more money using your gear if that is something you were not doing before. All right, thank you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Shaka bro.